All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I think um, we might have a couple more folks join us, but that is completely fine. So this is our fourth class and we are going over the third dialogue cycle. And so that's um, chapters 20 through, excuse me, 22 through 27. Um, this section isn't as exciting as the ones that come before it, I found personally. It's mostly a rehashing of the same arguments. Um, so we're not really getting anything new here. There's some beautiful poetry that comes through throughout this section, but by and large, the arguments are the same. Another part that we'll get into in detail is that this is the hardest section of the entire book to translate. There's numerous inconsistencies in the text. It seems to jump around who's speaking without saying so. Um, scholars are largely in agreement that the chapter breakdown um, that's presented in most translations isn't what's really going on in the text. And I'll, I'll explain that later. And I've actually got a chart. I meant to send it out to y'all by email, um, but I wanted to talk about it before I did. So I'll send that out after it, afterwards, but I will show it to you today. So a large part of today's discussion is gonna be talking about these inconsistencies in the text rather than what's going on um, specifically in the argument, though we will touch upon that. But then I wanna save a larger part of my discussion and yours to just talk about what has gone on throughout these three dialogue cycles. So not just chapter 22 through 27, but, but three through 27. What's the argument being made here um, by Job's friends and by Job? So um, let me start with the textual inconsistencies because I don't wanna read through and then say, oh, well, and this was going on. So I'm going to share my screen um, and, and hopefully this will give you, seeing it visually, um, will help you kind of get a better idea of what's going on. If there's anyone on phone call, just know that I will email this out later. Um, and I'll try to do my best to kind of explain what I'm walking through. All right. So I'm sharing my screen with you now. So as I mentioned before, chapter 22 through 27 um, is probably the hardest section for um, translators. They point towards um, not only the language and issues translating, but the inconsistency of voice. And so 22 and 23 are largely believed to be um, okay. 22 is Eliphaz, 22, or excuse me, 23 is Job. We get into 24 and it's primarily Job speaking, but all of a sudden we come to this um, section, 27, 18 through 24. By and large, this is of the entire section, the hardest passage to translate. Most folks, and I'm speaking here of commentators, but also folks that are doing translation of the Hebrew, say this section is not Job. So the, so although it is in <clears throat> a chapter that says Job is speaking, they believe that 18 through 24 is not Job. And then we get to 26, and 26, one through four, most people think is Job speaking, but 25, th excuse me, five through 14 of this section is not Job. So the first half is Job, and then the second half, five through 14, is most likely Bildad's speech. If this isn't clear, don't worry, because I have a chart that'll hopefully clarify it. So then we get to 27, 13 through 23, and that's towards the end of that section. And most people say, this isn't Job speaking. He's basically, if it was Job speaking, he's quoting his friends here. So what they think is going on is this is Zophar's speech, because Zophar's speech is missing from this section, Zophar, Zophar. Although one commentator doesn't agree with that. One commentator thinks Job is quoting his friends and making fun of him. So I've got, I, I don't know if this helps. I tried to present this in a, new, a, a bunch of different ways for people to see what was the clearest way. <clears throat> but you can think of this as a way um, the book is laid out here. What I think will be most helpful is this. So this is most scholars reading of this section. So if you'll just follow along, 22, the entire chapter is Eliphaz. Then we move to 23, and that's Job. Then we go to 24, 
verses 1 through 17 through 25, and that is Job 2. That section in the end right here, most commentators say that's one of Job's friends. That got put into that section, and for some reason it shouldn't, it did, but it shouldn't be there. That's one of Job's friends. Some people say it's um, Zophar's lost speech, but most just say we can't really say there. Then we go to chapter 25, and if you look in your Bible, all the translations that you have, 25, 1 through 6, right? That's the entirety of chapter 25, 1 through 6. And most commentators say, this is Bildad. And 26, 5 through 14, is the missing part of Bildad's speech. So then we go to 26, and that's 1 through 4. They say, this is Job speaking, and then it jumps past this part. Sorry past this part to this, and that's Job speaking as well. And then they say, we've lost so fair speech, but here it is, it's in 27 and it's verses 13 through 23. This is extremely confusing. It took me a while to get through this and to kind of think it through. I'm going to email this to you. I want to say, this is a really hard part of the book for translators to make sense of. No one is in complete agreement, but by and large, this is how most scholars read this section. However, I mentioned this book. Let me, this is, uh, this isn't working, is it? My, uh, my, my neat mangrove background is causing problems. I, uh, I, there we go. Edward Greenstein, he put out this translation of, of Job in, um, in 2019. It's probably the best translation from a sense of someone that has studied this text in depth, just Job, and spent literally their entire career translating it. It's not the easiest to read. I think Robert Alters is probably the easiest to read, but I would say that Greenstein is probably the most textually accurate. So Edward Greenstein follows what most commentators do up until uh, the 27th chapter. He says, everyone's quoting the end of it as if it's fair speech. But if you listen to how he quotes 2712, which leads into 13 through 23, it says, since you have all been witness, how could you be spewing such nonsense? And then he goes on to quote his friends. So all, all that Greenstein is saying is that um, 27 is Job. It's all Job. And that last part that people want to say is Ophir, that's just him quoting his friends and kind of mocking them. All right. I'm going to leave this unless anyone has any questions. I know this is confusing. Um, it's kind of getting into the weeds, but I wanted to do that because if you're reading in this section, there are parts where you're like, this doesn't seem right. Um, I noticed it most in 27, um, but let me stop there and say, does anyone have any questions just about this? You don't have to fully get it. I just have, I wonder if there's questions about that. <clears throat> Okay, if there are later, that's fine. We can take them then. I probably confused you more than you were already confused, um, but I just wanted to bring that up because I think that is an important part of this section. So let's get into the book. Let's go to chapter 22. This is the end of um, Eliphaz's speeches. So Eliphaz has speeches throughout each cycle, and this is his last one. Um, let me read uh, verses 1 through 9. Then Eliphaz the Timonite answered, Can a mortal be of use to God? Can even the wisest be of service to him? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if you are righteous? Or is it gain to him if you make your ways blameless? Is it for your piety that he reproves you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great? There's no end to your iniquities. For you have exacted pledges from your family for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have given no water to the weary to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. The powerful possess the land and the favored live in it, 
you have sent widows away empty-handed and the arms of the orphans you have crushed. This is a really um, biting passage. Eliphaz has gone from saying, um, you had to have done something wrong. There's, there's got to be a reason you're being punished. To verse 5 saying, is not your wickedness great? There is no end to your iniquities. So he's gone from hypothesizing that Job had to have done something wrong for all this to occur to him. And now he's saying, no, 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 no. You, you are wicked. You have not only not given water to those that were thirsty, you have stripped the naked of their clothing. You have exacted pledges from your family for no reason, which was a huge no-no in that day. You have sent the widows away empty-handed and the arms of the orphans you have crushed. That's really important. His friends are moving from this kind of, specifically Eliphaz, are moving from this sense of Job had to have done something wrong to just kind of coming up uh, out of nowhere seemingly and accusing Job of all of these things. If you think about how the Bible defines justice, what passages do you think about, right? We think about feed the, the widow and the orphan, clothe the, or clothe the naked, feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty. These, this is the kind of constant cry throughout the Old Testament. We see it in Deuteronomy. We see it throughout all of the prophets. <clears throat> um, and essentially, his friends are accusing him, uh, Eliphaz, that you've, done, you've, you've, you've gone against all of this. What the Bible considers just, you've gone against. And, and that's just such an important point to bring out because I, I, I think what we're seeing is this trajectory of his friends sitting in silence and there's a sense of compassion, right? There's a sense of care and restraint on, on their parts. And then they start to stop and they speak. And when they speak, it's like it gets progressively worse. And so through the first dialogue cycle, there's still compassion, but they're also beginning to question. And the second dialogue cycle, they're saying, you, this is what happens to the wicked. And the third, we have Eliphaz saying, you are wicked and you did X, Y, and Z. So I would say they're, the friends are getting progressively worse throughout this. However, we do have um, at the end of this section, um, so um, verse 10, I'm going to read 10 and 11 and then jump to the end. 10 says, therefore snares are around you and sudden terror overwhelms you or darkness so that you cannot see. A flood of water covers you. So this, this is happening because of those things you've done. But go to 21. Aaron, would you read 21 through 27? Please. Sure. Yep. Thanks. Verses 21 through 27. Um, hold on, I have dogs all over me right now. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove wickedness far from your tent and assign your nuggets to the dust and gold of Ophir, Ophir to the rocks in the, ra in the ravines, then the Almighty will be your gold, the choicest silver for you. Surely then you will find delight in the Almighty and will lift up your face to God. You will pray to him and he will hear you and you will fulfill your vows. You said through 27? Oh. I was muted, sorry. Yes, that's right. Thanks. So what's going on here is Eliphaz has gone from condemning him, saying you're wicked, this is why all this stuff has befallen you. But if you turn around, if you repent, forgiveness will be offered and there's still a chance to have salvation. So I want you to think about this, and this is something for us to talk about towards the end. Eliphaz has basically condemned Job for these wicked acts, and yet he's saying, if you turn around, if you repent, forgiveness can be had. Is Eliphaz a friend here? Is he being genuine and truly caring about Job's salvation, or has he just completely lost any credit as a friend of Job? And he's just kind of spouting off theological things. I th think about that, and we'll we'll get towards that towards the end. I just want you to think about what's going on here because I I do think the trajectory of Job's friends is by and large worse. Like it's getting worse and worse. 
so we come to 24, or excuse me, to 23. And 23 is um, Job kind of lamenting again what is going on with him. Um, and uh, Bill Hull, would you read verses, um, let's see, would you read verses 1 through 13? Whoops, now I'm on. Yes, you are. Thanks. Okay. 27, 1 through 13. 20, 27 or 23? Sorry, 23. <laughs> Have you had your coffee yet this morning, Will? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm trying to get it down right now. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Chapter 23, the verses again, Will. I'll listen this time. Uh, one, 1 through 13. Okay. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could reason with him and I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he is not there, or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides, and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right, but I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come out like gold. My foot has held, ha held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and have not turned aside. I have, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured in my bosom the words of his mouth, but he stands alone and who can dissuade him? What, what he desires that he does. Thanks. So I, I think 23 is one of the most pivotal speeches of Job in this section. Um, we have more from Job in this section, but I think this, this part is kind of the pivotal part on Job. Um, one, because it's just a consistent part of Job. There's not the kind of mumble jumble that I pointed out at the beginning. And two, there's a lot going on here. So verse three kind of starts the theme for this section. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his dwelling. Uh, someone just asked what translation Bill Hole's using, and he's using the NRSV, right? Yep. Yeah, he's using the NRSV. That's the one that is in the pews at church. Um, so, uh, so yeah, verse three starts this theme of Job trying to find God. And I think that's so important because a lot of us know that God is going to speak, right? Most of us have read Job, or if we haven't read Job, we've read sections of Job, and we know that God is going to speak. But you have to think about if you're a first-time reader, we don't know if God's going to speak or not. Heck, we're 23 chapters in and we haven't heard anything from Job, uh, from God except the prologue, right? And that was questionable. So we, we, we have this, this determination on Job's part to find God, which I think is so important in spite of his kind of anger towards God, his calling God an enemy, um, his, his thinking that God is unjust. He's still looking for God, and that's important, right? And that's why we can say this is a prayer and not some blasphemous curse, because it is directed towards God seeking out relationship of some sort. And then we get to verse 4, and we return to the legal argument. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. So Job still wants to come before God and present his case. He still thinks that he is right, that he is blameless. Uh, in spite of all the accusations his friends have leveled against him, in spite of the awful accusation we just read in, in chapter 22 from Elevast saying, you did this, you did this, you did this. But there's also a recognition of God's magnificence, of God's power, of God's godness that's spans way beyond humanity, right? So if you look at verse um, six, would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? 
No, but he would give heed to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? So, so Job is saying, I desire to be in front of God, but ultimately God is greater than me. And I think this is important. We often think of God, uh, Job as this kind of wild, angry person, but there is a respect of God's greatness that exceeds beyond. And I want to point out something um, the commentator James Wharton points out that I think is really important. Job is accusing God of being unjust towards him, but he also believes that God is just, right? Why else would he want to go to court with God? Think about it this way. If you've been charged with a crime and, and, and it's been a false accusation, so let's say someone uh, charges you with stealing something from a store and you say, no, 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 I bought it. Would you want to go to a court if you thought the courts were corrupt? right? You don't, you don't stand a chance. If the courts are corrupt, you don't stand a chance. Job, though he thinks God has accused him um, in, in a way that's false, or he's punishing him in a way that's not deserved, he still wants his day in court. And that speaks to this ultimate trust that God is, is finally, in the end, just. That's, that's something I put, I put up, uh, brought up last week, but I think it's really important to this, right? Job has the the psychological, the spiritual depth to question what's going on, but also to ultimately trust that God is just. So um, verse 8 through 10 is this beautiful passage, and I think the NRSV uh, doesn't capture it. Um, so I want to read from uh, Greenstein's translation. 23... Um, hold on. So I'm reading uh, verses eight through nine. This is Greenstein translating, and I think it captures more this, the, um, the kind of pathos of what Job's going through. But east I go, and he is not there, and west, but I do not discern him. North in his concealment, I do not grasp him. He cloaks himself south, so I do not see him right? Instead of this kind of moving around, it's like Job spanning the entirety of the, of the world. He's going north, east, east, south, and west looking for God, and God is nowhere to be found. I, 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 if I say, if there's any part to read again from this section, read 23, because it just captures how much Job feels lost, how he can't find God, and yet how he's yearning deep, deep within himself to find God. So 24 is um, Job speaking again. I'm not going to read from this chapter, but I want to point out um, one thing. Job is speaking in 23 of his own issues, and 24 he's lamenting the kind of corporate suffering, the, the cosmic suffering. So he's moving beyond his own person to the suffering of, of the world as we know it. And then we get to chapter 25, which is the shortest chapter in Job, right? It's six. Six, sec, uh, six verses. Um, let's see. Sally Waterstrat, I'm going to unmute you. If you would read one through six of chapter 25, I would appreciate it. Then Bill Bad the Sh Sh Shuhite replied, Dominion and awe belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? Upon whom does his light not rise? How then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less man, who is but a maggot, a son of man, who is only a worm? So that's a, a, a basically just saying, Job, you, you talk about a case you have. You're just a maggot. You're a worm. Um, some beautiful cut down poetry right there uh, from Bildad. So, so after that, what's did someone say something? Oh, I'm talking. Just ignore me. Okay, I'll mute y'all then. Thank, <laughs> thank, thank y'all for reading. There's a temptation in Zoom when you're the host to have too much power. <laughs> so. Um, so 25 is Bildad speaking, and then we move to 26, and this is Job um, 
Job replying, and Job does kind of agree with Bildad here that 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 God's majesty is unsearchable, and yet he maintains this kind of integrity. So I'm going to look at verses 1 through 4 of 26. Then Job answered, how, how you have helped one who has no power, how you have assisted the arm that has no strength, how you have counseled one who has no wisdom and given much advice, with whose help have you uttered words, and whose spirit has come forth from you? So Job is digging back at his friends, so to speak. And I think verse four is really important here because he's not only refuting his friends, but he's questioning, where does this wisdom that you speak of come from, right? It says, uh, verse four, with whose help have you uttered words and whose spirit has come forth from you? So now Job has turned the tables and he's, he's saying, you don't speak as people of God, you speak from something else. You speak of something that's untrue, unwise, um, that isn't of God. And I, and I, that that's a refutation. But I, I think for us, we have to put ourselves in the uh, in the the ancient reader of this, and that would have been a really big dig. That's essentially saying, you know, you're speaking from a, a place that's demonic or not of God. And then let's look. Um, so uh, 5 through 14, this is a section that a lot of people attribute uh, to Bildad. Um, I'm just going to read a couple verses from it because it's kind of going back. If you're reading this as Job, it seems like Job's kind of agreeing with the cosmic majesty of God. But a lot of people say this sounds too much like what Bildad was getting at. And so this is Bildad speaking. But just listen to this part. I'm starting at verse 5. The shades below tremble, the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before God, and Abaddon has no covering. He stretches out Zephon over the void and hangs the earth upon nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not torn open by them. He covers the face full of the full moon. He covers the face of the full moon and spreads over its cloud. He has described a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. So you can see there, there's this kind of cosmic imagery, and, and it makes sense why this might be connected to chapter 25 to build that speech. If you read it as Job speaking, then you can just read it as Job kind of saying um, to his friends, you don't know where you're speaking from. God is much further beyond anything you could handle, that you could hold, that you could speak of. That leads us to chapter 27, and this is um, the last chapter from the dialogue cycle, right? We'll get um, to this, uh, chapter 28 is this kind of poem on wisdom, and then um, uh, Job speaking, and then ultimately we'll get into the speeches of Elihu or Elihu. Um, so from 27, I want to look at uh, 1 through 6 first. Hey, Joette, would you read um, 1 through 6 from chapter 27? You're unmuted. Okay. And Job continued his discourse. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice, the Almighty who has made me taste bitterness of soul. As long as I have life within me, the breath of God in my nostrils, my lips will not speak wickedness, and my tongue will utter no deceit. I will never admit you are in the right till I die. I will not deny my integrity. Oh, I'm sorry. What, where do I end? Uh, just one more verse. Uh, verse six. I will maintain my righteousness and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. Thanks. So um, this, is, um, this is Job kind of reiterating, I am not going to give up. I am blameless and I'm going to hold fast to that. Verse 5, um, I'm reading from the NRSV, says, Far be it from me to say that you are right. Until I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. Job doesn't know, and Job's friends don't know what we know from the prologue, right? That God and, and the accuser, ha Satan, the Satan, made this agreement. And what did it kind of um, circle around? It circled around Job's integrity. So if you go all the way back to 2.3, I read this a couple times last week, but this is such an important verse. So I'm in chapter 2, verse 3. The Lord said to Satan, 
Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Now I'm going to read that second sentence again. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Okay? He persists in his integrity, and then God is saying, You kind of um, antagonize me to destroy him for no reason. That's so important. There is no reason for this, right? So we go all the way back to 25, excuse me, to 27, verse 5. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Until I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. So James uh, Wharton, who's one of the commentators I'm reading, he points out, and, and the section that we have read so far, this is the closest Job gets to the truth of the matter. And the truth of the matter is this kind of cosmic secret, right? That we know because we read the prologue. And that is that God and Satan made this kind of bet. And that for no reason, Job has been punished. And what God wants and what God hopes for is that Job will maintain his integrity, right? And so Job is here. He's been battered by the loss of family, the loss of property, by personal suffering, right? He's covered with sores from head to toe. And then after all of that, his friends just accuse him left and right. And still, he persists in his integrity. And so James Wharton says, this is, this is Job at almost at the cusp of an epiphany. He's almost fully realized um, the secret, that his suffering is for, there's no reason to it, and that he is, he is righteous, despite what everyone else says. So that's, that's kind of the main uh, part of this section. I, I want to point out the kind of textual problem here. So if you go to um, verse 13, it says, um, verse 13, this is a portion of the wicked with God and the heritage that oppressors receive from the Almighty. If their children are multiplied, it is for the sword, and their offspring have not enough to eat. Those who survive them, the pestilence, fairies, and their widows make no lamentation. Though they heap up silver like dust and pile up clothing like clay, they may pile it up, but the just will wear it, and the innocent will divide the silver. Job is essentially here, if you take this to be Job, saying what his friend said. So. Um, I, I remember reading this and being like, this is the exact opposite of what Job said in the second dialogue cycle. In the second dialogue cycle, he said, the wicked get off scot-free. And, you know, remember there's that part about their, their cows have offspring and, and produce, um, their children and children's children sur survive and have plenty. So this is where most commentators say, this is Zophar speech. This is the law Zophar um, speech of Zophar, because we don't have that in here. But Edward Greenstein, and I tend to agree with him, because I think he makes a good point here. Look at uh, verse 12 in your, um, at 2712. This is the kind of hinge verse to how you, uh, how you translate this. So I'm going to read the NRSV, which says, all of you have seen it yourselves. Why then have you become altogether vain? If you have another translation, will you read it? Okay, I see uh, Marsha, and then I'll get to Sally. Alter says uh, on 12, look, all of you have beheld it, and why do you spew empty breath? Okay, thanks. Anyone? Uh, so Sally? Jerusalem Bible. Oh, uh, hold on one second, Dave. Go ahead, Sally. You have all seen this yourselves. Why then this meaningless talk? Thanks. And Dave? Jerusalem Bible has, and if you all had understood them for yourselves, you would not have wasted your breath in empty words. Thanks. So I, I think uh, the altar and the Jerusalem Bible get closest to, to what's going on here. And you'll see... Um, 
This is what Greenstein reads. Since you have yourselves all been witness, how could you be spewing such nonsense? And then he has a colon. And that's like, okay, now Job is going to quote all the nonsense you've been spewing. I tend to think that's probably the best reading here. There, there are a lot of textual inconsistencies in this section, but it does seem like based off of the Hebrew, what's going on here is Job is just kind of re reiterating what his friends have said, but beginning with this is nonsense or empty breath. An empty breath would have been an insult. Like you're, It's like if I'm saying, hey, you're spewing hot air here. So that's what I take 13 um, th through the remainder of that, that uh, through 23 to be. That was a lot. Let me get to some questions I've, I've been asking myself in this section and then we'll open it up for dialogue. So we're, we're at the end of the dialogue cycle here. And one of the things I wanna ask that I've been thinking about is what picture did Job's friends paint of God? Who is the God that they present? Another question. Have Job's friends completely sacrificed their claims of friendship? Another question. Is the book of Job and the three dialogue cycles pointing to love, compassion as the mark of true friendship? Is it using Job's friends as a counterpoint, basically saying this isn't what friendship looks like? Friendship looks like something more that we're seeing at the end of chapter two, where they're sitting in silence, they're being friends. The, the follow-up question I have for that, it's easy for us to say friendship is love, right? This is the hard question I have. If, if, if Job is pointing to friendship as love and compassion and not argument, the question comes back to us. Are we willing to sacrifice to sacrifice our claims of right and wrong in the context of friendship? Are we willing to put our claims to rightness aside and not just get caught up in an argument with our friends so that we can be compassionate? Another question, aren't Job's friends essentially what a, uh, the Satan, the accuser, accuses Job of? Fair weather believers, aren't, um, that is, another way of phrasing that is, aren't Job's friends, isn't their faith contingent on good things happening to good people? And then my last question is, is the book of Job making the claim that life is not fair? Just because good, um, just because you are good, doesn't mean that good will happen to you. We see this with the pandemic, right? The pandemic is affecting everyone, the wicked and the just. It has no kind of discrimination towards who you are. And so I'm wondering if what the book of Job is trying to get at is that life isn't about fairness. Life isn't about good things happening to good people or evil things happening to evil people, but rather that life isn't fair, that life isn't perfect. I think it's going to go beyond that, but I think that's where it is now. And then the last thing, I, the last question I have is, if Job is on a spiritual journey of sorts, where is he right now? So um, with all of that, I will leave it to you. What questions, thoughts, reflections do y'all have? Raise your hand or unmute yourself. And if you're on a phone, it's star six. Can you unmute me? Oh, Barbara. Uh, yeah, um, I have found that this is especially, especially interesting right now. Um, I am so angry at a lot of people right now in the world of politics because of things that are happening and especially to poor people. And I have been desperate enough, I read the Bible, but I've also been reading Emma Children and she said something very interesting and that was, may this bastard and I achieve illumination together. And I thought, well, maybe Job could have said that because I don't think his friends were friends. I don't think that's any definition of friendship. So um, I, I think quoting a Buddhist monk in the middle of Job is a little weird, but that's my thing for today. Uh, that's um, that's uh, 
say the um the the name again because the the book is what chaos or something or things fall apart um, a book about called biting the hook um and about biting the hook when it's it's offered to you and has to do with somebody uh inciting your anger and talking Mm -hmm. about being patient in the face of anger and um and it's it, it helps me a little thanks yeah, so I think that's a good point. The 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 point of the 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 larger point here is um, is uh, and I think this is what Barbara was speaking to. Just because someone is being ill will towards you or wishing you um, ill will doesn't mean that you're supposed to return that. And so um, I I think we will see this in Job. For y'all that have read the entirety of the book, you will see even though Job's friends have been terrible to him, he's not terrible ultimately in return. Thanks. Uh, Anyone else? What other thoughts, questions, reflections do you have? Raise a hand or unmute yourself. All right, I see Sally. Go ahead. Um, One thought that I have had about all this, I got the impression that maybe the friends thought it was their duty to chastise um, Job and that they were telling it like it was. Well, from what we know, they haven't been telling the truth about Job. Now, that's our, you know, 21st century observation looking at Job. But um, I think it's important to be honest with friends, but you have to be careful not to say things that aren't. Uh, true. Don't just go after somebody for whatever ulterior motive you might have. Am I making that clear? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a a clear point. I think that's, I I think that's one of the geniuses of Job is that we have the prologue and the prologue is only um, the reader knows the prologue. Job and his friends don't. And so that's that throughout the entirety of the book, there's this kind of, um, overarching reminder you don't have the full story and i think that's a reminder for us to bring into situations with our friends or even those um, neighbors of ours that we would be quick to judge we don't have the full story it's kind of you know it's like the prologue's kind of hammering that again and again and again but yeah that's a that's an important point to to remember throughout so i see sherry Sherry Leppers, it just, go ahead. It just brought to mind our uh, legal system in the United States with justice being blindfolded and how difficult that is. Mm. Yeah. Yep, that's, uh, you know, we, we seek after justice, but it is always imperfect. Okay. Yes, Faye, go ahead. Um. You, one of the uh, questions you posited was about um, God and the relationship with God and Job. So I want to go to 23, and I'm from the King James Version, and this was the language he used in 23.6, and he says, will he plead against me with his great power? He said, no, but he would put strength in me. And I think that's him saying, ultimately, God's still going to be there for me. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's kind of like the paradox of Job, right? He yells at God, and yet he seeks God out. And that's why I think it's, it's, it's important and true to call what's going on here prayer. Thanks. Who else has a question, thought, or reflection? Will? Yes. Uh, I think one of the most important sections for me is uh, 2315, where Job says, that is why I am full of fear before him. Mm. And the more I think, the greater grows my dread of him. God has made my heart sink. Shaddai has filled me with fear for darkness hides me from him and the gloom veils his presence from me. And I think those are important because both the friends 
and the Satan are talking about the cycle of retribution. Justice is retribution, according to the friends. The Satan has a bet that Job is going to respond by cursing God. What, what Job is saying here in 15 through 17, he's saying the only way that he sees that the cycle of retribution is being broken is his fear of God. There is a greater power that's going to break the cycle of retribution, whether it's forgiveness for the sins or it's uh, some other uh, mechanism of retribution. The only thing that's going to break it is the power and the fear standing before God and admitting that you don't understand. The cycle is broken. It's the only way to do it. Yeah, that's a that's an important um, couple of verses there. Um, that, and I think it ties into that paradox I was talking about earlier. It's just he's he's seeking God out. He's mad at God, but ultimately he thinks God will be just. Um, but I, I think you bring in that important point. This is speaking against this kind of retribution, this kind of tit for tat. This, if you're good, good things will happen. If you're wicked, wicked things will happen. And that's that's what the friends believe God is is has put forth and what Job is speaking against throughout. I think it's really important to remember what Dave has pointed out as we get into um, God's speech from the whirlwind, because I think that really kind of encapsulates kind of what Job's pointing towards here. Thanks, Dave. I uh, I, yep. wanted to, I wanted to put on my Mother's Day hat because this has made me um, think about my our, our kids and um, probably everybody's experience. The kids were constantly saying, but it's not fair. And I remember saying to them, well, life's not fair. But there's something deeply ingrained in all of us that says life ought to be fair. Mm -hmm. And I think to some extent, this underscores uh, nobody ever gave you that money back guarantee that everything's going to be fair. Um, but uh, we do have the promise that God is with us, that God will uh, allow us to say, I mean, I think about Jeremiah as well as Job, you know, to wrestle with him, to, to have that relationship, but there's no guarantee of fairness. Yeah, I think that's probably the hardest question that arises out of these first 27 chapters. Because as much as we say life isn't fair to ourselves, there's kind of this little voice in the back that's saying, well, it's fair for me. It's got to be fair for me at least, right? And, and I think, I think in, in the context of faith, this is one of the hardest things that we struggle with because we want the wicked to be punished and we want good things to happen to good people and that's not how the world plays out and so the theological work i i would say is not making sense of that not trying to explain why that happens but rather to trust that there is something greater going on right that there is a god that this isn't just meaningless and that and that's kind of the divergence point the, the faith of Job's friends is one of life is fair. And Job is, is breaking off from them. And, I, and I, I say again and again, this is a spiritual journey on Job's part. And he's not, he's not fully there yet, but he's walking towards this point. And he's, he's made the hard, I, I would say almost reluctant decision to to. to to agree that life isn't fair. And that's where he diverges. And that's a really hard thing to do. And I think we're all called to do that at some point to come to terms with that. And now Job is on this path trying to make sense, not in a, in a sense of like expl explanation, but experientially or through his faith to kind of understand what the other path is. What does that look like? And that path for him is one that is leading towards God. That's important. He's not just giving up and becoming nihilistic. Uh, 
Why is that path so hard to walk? Because he feels alone. He's screaming out, where's God? I've gone north, north, east, south, and west, and I can't find God. But he is still seeking after God. Thanks, Marcia. Who else has thoughts, reflections, questions? I sound like a carnival barker. I see Bill Hull. Go ahead. Oh, there we go. Yep. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, listening to Marcia reminds me that I believe it's from Jesus in the New Testament. God causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, rain to fall on the just and the unjust. This may be a little radical, but you can take from that. God is, of all beings, most unfair. That's not fair, right? <laughs> that that the bad guys <laughs> get sunshine and rain. I take both of those images to be positive. We need sunlight and water to live. Um, and yet, on the other hand, I think I said this in the earlier broadcast, I understand the desire to try to make sense of things. That, that we're, we're created in some ways to seek to understand. Um, that famous, is it Anselm's quote, theology is uh, faith seeking understanding. That's not a bad thing. Um, I think in Job, it becomes, the, the escalating of this sounds so exaggerated. I was struck by what you said. It, it's like, we haven't been cruel enough. Now we're going to accuse you of harming the most vulnerable people in the world. It's like, what in the world? How could friends say that with apparently no, no basis for it? Um, and I don't know how I would resolve this, except that it's understandable. We want life to be fair, and I want to make sense of things. But ultimately, things happen. What, you know, who was the rabbi when bad things happen to good people? You know, that, that struggle. Uh, so I, <laughs> I look forward to some uh, resolution, and you're going to do that for us, right, Will? <laughs> uh, no, I, this will just get more and more confusing, I promise you. <laughs> I, uh, I'm reading through um, three or four books outside of just commentaries on Job right now on different people's interpretations of it, and they are truly all different. So we won't, we won't reach any resolution. <clears throat> but I, I, I do think that one, one of the resolutions here is it's, it's not speaking against understanding as a whole, but trying to understand suffering and evil. Because I think it, it's saying trying to understand or explain evil perpetuates evil, right? That's what the friends are doing. Job is suffering for no reason. We know there's no reason. Chapter 2, verse 3 says there is no reason. And yet, his friends are kind of adding on to the, the suffering for no reason. So, uh, Dennis? Yeah. Okay, this is Betsy's hand. Oh, Betsy, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I saw a comment from Aaron, so okay. go ahead. That's fine. One I'll click you are to blame me, Will. <laughs> well, it is, it is your fault here. <laughs> um, one of your questions, I believe, Will, was where do you see Job in, in his faith walk at this point? And I guess one, one of the things that struck me today is I see that Job has kind of rounded the, the curve. He, I saw confidence that even, you know, all that he's been through and before he was screaming out like, why? And I wish I were dead and this and that. But now it's like, regardless of what's happened, he still knows that there's a powerful God. And that, that he trusts that, you know, he still wants to, to be God's friend and he wants to try to go to God's court. I, I just thought to me, the faithfulness of Job is really shining out towards, I forget which chapter it was that we read where Job is just confirming, I know, I know that, that, that you know, things are going to work out and that God will listen to me at some point. So I saw that as positive that, that regardless of what we're going through it's 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 it kind of compels me to think we we need to continue the good fight and trust in 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 what we know is the right way thanks betsy yeah i think um 
I think Job is at a place. Yeah, I, I would agree. He's progressed beyond the earlier cries of kind of helplessness and life is meaningless and I want to die. Um, and now he's in a place of seeking out God. And so it's that kind of paradoxical relationship of I'm still angry. I still don't understand this, but I am asking for God. I'm looking for God. I'm, I'm wanting God to be, to be here. Um, so yeah, it, and, and that's a great point is that there is a kind of progression of faith that's going on here. There is a journey happening. Um, and there's an understanding going on. I, I would say that understanding is more experiential than intellectual, right? He's living out the questions, unlike his friends who are just kind of spouting them off intellectually. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, we've got, uh, well, it's 11 o'clock. Does anyone have any last minute thoughts, reflections? All right, so next week um, we are reading a much smaller section. Let me pull up. Uh, I'm, I just want to say, should have had this earlier. But like Job, I'm not, but unlike Job, I'm not perfect because I guess Job is blameless and upright. Okay, next week we are reading the soliloquy section, which is a meditation on wisdom and then Job's summation, and that's chapters 28 through 31. Um, yes, Marsha. Hold on. I, oh, I think I did it. There you go. Why does, why does Greenstein not have chapter 28? Uh, I haven't read that far in Greenstein, so I couldn't answer. Oh, you know what? I bet he puts it elsewhere. I'll look. I just opened up to see what we were going to read next week, and there was no 28. Well, the, the, I, 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 he puts it in, uh, on page 152. Yeah, he just puts it elsewhere. Oh, it looks like Marsha. Oh, that's for, all right. You can. Yep, he put it. I can't hear you because you're freezing up, but yeah, he puts it elsewhere. Okay. So let me say a quick prayer, and um, and uh, and then we can go our separate ways. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for this day and this opportunity to gather in this way over video to see each other's faces and to hear each other's voices. We give you thanks for fellowship in whatever way it happens, and we give you thanks for Palmasia Presbyterian Church and the way you have weaved each and every one of us together into a community of believers. We give you thanks for the community of believers that has gone before us and wrestled with suffering just as we are now, especially those that have used the book of Job as a place to, to hold that wrestling, to ask the questions that are hard to ask, but to honestly and genuinely seek you out. Lord, yet let your spirit continue to be present in our questions and in our honest asking. As we go forth into this world, seeking to show compassion and love to those that we meet. We ask this all in your son, our savior's name. Amen. Thank you all so much. If you have questions, email me. Um, and if not, I will see you next Sunday. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. There we go. Thank you, Will. Yep. Thank you all. Bye-bye.